Hello, my name is Adam Neely. This is question and answer time number 20. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. Thanks, Adam. Like this just as much as the theory. More questions. One, to what degree do various bandmates or you get wasted on the gig? I know a guy whose performance goes through the roof with only a small hit to his quality of playing, a good trade-off. I really don't drink at these sorts of wedding and event gigs for two reasons. The first reason is it's fairly unprofessional to be doing that in that sort of context to be drinking with the guests. But more importantly, number two is that at the end of the night, you're exhausted. And the last thing you want to have been doing is drinking the entire night and then have to pack up all of your gear and then drive home several hours. Especially if you're doing that several times within a weekend, it's just unbelievably exhausting. So nobody in the band really drinks. For other kinds of gigs, yeah, maybe I'll drink a little bit, but honestly, I kind of like being in a sound frame of mind when I'm playing music. Was this a 10 hour wedding? Well, no, it wasn't a 10 hour wedding, but it was definitely an all day sort of affair. I mean, the wedding itself with the ceremony and the prelude for the ceremony, and then the cocktail hour and then the reception might have like I think it was about six six and a half hours total for everything but then the day itself is a really long one because we have to travel like the hour and a half outside of New York City I have to travel to the pickup point to grab everybody I have to pick up the zip car before and down which takes an hour back to the city and the drive so it's a long long day I love the synth bass on I want to dance with somebody what filter are you using for that reverse wah slash moog effect for all my synth type tones on these gigs I have a boss OC2 just octave pedal down and then I run that through an envelope filter, my Source Audio Bass Envelope Filter Pro, which I like because it's very customizable. It's kind of hard to dial in good sounds, but once you have a good sound, it's just like perfect. So I really like using that for any type of synth bass type things like on I Want to Dance with Somebody. Hey Adam, how many singers do you have in your cover band? Are they able to pull off more than three sets without their voices getting fatigued? So for this band, we have four singers contracted for every gig, two male, two female. And it works out really well because modern pop music generally is very, very vocally demanding, very yelly. And so after a long evening, especially four and a half hours for some of these receptions, it can be a little much just to do it with two singers, especially if we're doing it, you know, several gigs in a row. So four singers sounds great. Um, people can sing background for each other as one particular singer sings lead, and then they'll have time to cycle through waiting for their next song. Do you as a wedding band take song requests from event guests? And if you do, have you ever received some odd song, metal or rap, or some other uncelebratory slash unpleasant genre? So yeah, we get requests all the time. And fortunately, a lot of the time they're good ideas. Like maybe somebody will say, hey, could you play Uptown Funk? And we're like, we were planning on doing that later, so don't worry, we got you. But very often, uh, you know, maybe it's not a great request. If it's from the bride or the groom, we'll try and play it, and we'll try and figure out a place to play it, but man, most of the time we just say we don't know it, even if we do, because, you know, we want to make sure that people are having a good time and having a big party the entire night through, and there's nothing that kills the vibe more than a bad request at the wrong time. That was pretty cool, but I feel like the drums were a bit much for basic Vaporwave, which is supposed to be chill and hypnotic. Yeah, so that track definitely probably couldn't be considered Vaporwave, now could it? Because it was definitely not hypnagogic and chill out music by any stretch of the definition, and that's probably one of the main sort of key factors in understanding what Vaporwave is, getting that sort of vibe. And that track definitely did not have that vibe, but I still sort of approached it in a similar sort of manner, so I called it Vaporwave. Some people called it, uh, what do they call it, Prog Wave or Vapor Prog. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> as soon as you spoke about the genre and claimed all those articles are good representations of the genre, I wish I could flag all your channel. Go for it. Not really planning to do it. it was more of an empty threat. But seriously, this video sucked because you treated the genre as a fucking internet meme and really didn't do much of music theory at all. I definitely knew that this comment was coming and I savored it. Oh man, did I savor it. The Vaporwave purist. Oh my God, it's hilarious. Already the subculture has its elites. Fortunately, I think many people in the community actually enjoyed it. Uh, it was posted to the Vaporwave Reddit and there were some comments and a lot of people said like, oh, by the way, you know, you should really check out the modern Vaporwave stuff. The stuff that you focused on was like much older and not doesn't really represent the genre. And that track that you did wasn't really Vaporwave, but you know, it's a good analysis. And I was like, thanks guys, that's actually really validating. But man, this was hilarious getting this particular comment. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. Hey Adam, have you seen Evan Marion's stuff? I think you would really like it. For your next Q&A, do you think it's necessary to go to music school to become a great musician? So I do know Evan Marion. We went to school together. He's a cool guy. I'm a big fan of his. In terms of going to music school, is it necessary to become a good musician? Well, no, but it's certainly made easier. Now the flip side of that is, does going to music school make you a good musician? Definitely not. 
Oh my God, no, definitely no. But going to music school will give you the tools in order to become a good musician and a great musician a lot easier. It gives you a much better system and it also puts you in an environment where there are like-minded individuals also trying ostensibly to become good musicians. And so that sort of general atmosphere will definitely give you the tools a lot faster than if say you didn't go to music school. Vaporwave strikes me as the musical equivalent of pop art with a lot of the same arguments coming from both its fans and its critics. In the end, whether it's Warhol painting, Campbell's soup cans, or Macintosh Plus slowing down a Diana Ross song, it might not connect with you or seem like real art, but it certainly leaves an impression and makes some clear statements and MO, that's what art is really about. I think that's a fantastic analogy. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah, Andy Warhol Hall's like Campbell soup can definitely literally was just a Campbell soup can, but then recontextualized and because it was recontextualized in a particular way, it evoked a much different feeling and created a very different sort of understanding of what that object was. The similar sort of thing with Vaporwave and the Plunderphonic techniques, it's just recontextualizing it. For me personally, I'm not a huge fan of Andy Warhol, but that's a great analogy anyway. Why are you always playing this P bass? I find them kind of infantile. Yeah, man, P basses are really infantile. Pino Palladino, most infantile bass player there is. One could suggest this is regurgitated bovine excrement. Also, it could be construed as Weasley Newton vapor, appealing to the cult of primeval anti-intellectualism. One could suggest that. Couldn't one? Rather long question from a guy who really doesn't know a lot about theory. So in the old days, I don't know when, but a long time ago, when people heard chords with thirds, they sounded very jumbled and confusing, right? But now humans have developed to hear the third and seventh of a chord rather clearly without it sounding bunched up. Will this pattern continue with more notes on the scale? And if it does, what scale degree do you think will sound best next? So about five or six centuries ago, the interval of a third, like from C to E, was considered dissonant. It was considered bad, it didn't sound good. Which is really strange, because if you played C and E, you'll notice, hey, it sounds great. It's like one of the most consonant intervals there are. And basically the progression of Western music since then has been adding more and more different complex intervals to it. Third, the seventh, the ninth, thirteenth, all these sort of chromatic alterations to the scale to the point where our ears could become used to it all. So it was a progression of consonants, so more and more things started sounding good to our ears. And that was a very exciting time at the turn of the 20th century for composers, because they were like, oh my God, I can start using all this other stuff, and it's very exciting. And then 12-tone serialism happened. And the whole idea with 12-tone serialism was that there was no meaningful distinction between consonant intervals and dissonant intervals because it all started kind of combining into this just general soup of harmony. And people rejected that pretty significantly. It turns out there is a limit to what we can actually accept as consonant versus dissonant. And in the hundred years since that's happened, we've kind of reached a stasis depending on what sort of aesthetic we're talking about. Are we talking about jazz? What sorts of things can the jazzier accept? Are we talking about classical? Are we talking about rock? And the idea of what's consonant and what's dissonant changes depending on exactly what sort of music you might be listening to. But it's a really interesting sort of idea check out the Wikipedia article on consonants and dissonance. Every channel is turning to Patreon. I understand it's tough to make ends meet, but we've lost learning and sharing for educational purposes and gained yet another sales pitch selling the stuff we used to just talk freely about. Good luck, Adam. I'm sure you'll be a big success. So I knew this sort of comment would be coming, the idea that, you know, Patreon is somehow selling out. Nobody who has ever complained about somebody else selling out has earnestly tried to make a living doing art. It also goes to show how you might actually value what it is that I do and the time that I put into these videos, because this is not simply me making a couple posts on a Reddit thread. This is actually me spending hundreds of hours creating new content, putting a lot more time than you might actually think into all of this. And I guarantee you that you wrote that comment on some sort of device which cost $400 or more, and yet you're complaining about continuing to have free content and just me having a means of continuing to create free content. Now, I totally understand if you think that me having a Patreon will change the quality of my content for the worse, and all I can do is I can guarantee you, no, it won't, it will just make it better because I will be able to afford more time to actually dedicate towards it. But I'm not a punk rocker from the 80s who has an anarchical view about money. It also goes a step further because it's not like I'm just creating music, I'm creating educational videos. Videos. And it's the idea that education and information are so ubiquitous that the idea of creating new information and new educational content is essentially worthless. Can you make a list of most important songs to know for gigs? Learn Brown Eyed Girl and Lord Don't Stop Believing. Hey Adam, have you listened to a prog band Native Construct at all? They all went to Berkeley and their debut album Quiet World is one of my all time favorites. If I hadn't checked out Native Construct, I checked out their album and I was pleasantly surprised. Thank you for that suggestion. I would say that I like the fact that there are prog rock bands out there that are not sort of taking the gent metal sort of approach to creating textures and creating harmony. Don't get me wrong, Animals as Leaders is probably one of my favorite bands, but at the same time, it's nice to see when people aren't going in that direction and taking a little bit more, I guess, 
quasi dream theatery approach. Another band that I really like that has taken this is Thank You Scientist. I actually opened for Thank You Scientist once without knowing that it was Thank You Scientist. It was at like one of their debut shows or it was like their debut, at, I don't know, it was a big debut for them at Mexicali Live in New Jersey. And I was playing with a pop rock band beforehand that was not good at all. So it was incredibly embarrassing that I was like there and then they were creating like crazy amazing prog rock art. Anyway, so that's really cool. The other thing that I liked about the fact is that the bass was mixed very high and you could really hear the bass and it was nice and full and fat on that album. You don't really hear the bass that often in those contexts, and that was awesome. So, cool, thank you for the suggestion. Hey Adam, do you think that children who are exposed to music, classical music, or high information music become more intelligent? I definitely reject that idea. The idea that if you play high information music or classical music, it will make your kids smarter. So the kind of person that will just play classical music to their kid and expect them to get smarter or whatever, is not gonna be engaged with that kid in terms of getting them to understand the nuances, or like at least just getting them to engage in the music that they're listening to. Like if the kid is young, just trying to get them to vocalize along with the music, vocalize and like bop along and generally educate them about the music. I can think, I can definitely say that educating the kid in some sort of way about whatever music you're playing to them, it doesn't have to be classical music, it could be rap, who, who cares? Like as long as the kid is engaged with it, certain neural pathways will definitely become more activated if you're trying to get them engaged. But if it's just this passive background music, then it's just noise. Anyway, that was question and answer time, number 20 with Adam Neely. Thank you so much for watching. Please comment, like, and subscribe. And also, if you really enjoy my channel, you can definitely support me on Patreon, like these fine fellows have done, and fellowettes. People? Is fellow a gendered noun? Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, yeah, so please stay tuned for more on this channel. Uh, I have a new video coming out every Monday. And so, yeah, take it easy, guys.